Um, today we have uh, Professor Malik Maza. Um, he has been doing a lot of things on, on the continent uh, of Africa and he, ha he has, uh, he will tell you about uh, himself. He's one of our leading uh, physicists uh, on the continent. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to, uh, uh, to have him to be available to, uh, to talk to us. So uh, Malik, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And dear chair, please allow me to express my gratitude uh, uh, to, to you and to all the organizing committee of this uh, endeavor of the ISP CERN lectures. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us a space uh, in this uh, platform. So uh, the talk or the title of uh, my talk of today is uh, on the peculiar behavior of neutrons when, inter when it interacts with the nanostructures. So the idea is to bring the, uh, the high energy physics uh, to the nano sciences uh, field. And uh, the work that I will be uh, sharing with you, it's done within the framework of uh, what we call uh, uh, the UNESCO chair, but it's a trilateral partnership between the UNESCO, uh, which is the United Nations Education and Scientific and Cultural Organization, as well as UNISA, the University of South Africa, and Itamba Labs, which is a national facility of the National Research Foundation of South Africa. Uh, sorry. I cannot move, ah, sorry. Okay, so uh, in terms of my bio, I have been asked by the uh, by Professor Samagan to present myself. Uh, I uh, I hold a PhD in wave matter in neutron optics in 1993 from CR Saclay Pi Six, and uh, I am a joint staff of Itamba Labs, uh, NRF, and the University of South Africa, and uh, I am the current incumbent of the UNESCO UNISA Itamba Labs Africa Chair in nanosciences and nanotechnology. Uh, well, my focus of uh, research and interest is in the field of multidisciplinary, uh, sorry, it's in the multidisciplinary uh, field of nanosciences and nanotechnology. I belong to a, a number of uh, scientific academies through which we advocate for uh, the science and technology and innovation uh, uh, in Africa, as well as uh, uh, also we advocate for peace through science diplomacy. Well, for those who would like to uh, uh, synergize with us, I have two emails down there. You can reach me in one of them. Uh, the outline of my talk today uh, is uh, consists on six points. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, if you allow me to do so, to present to you more or less who is the U2 ACN2. And after we go through the, the science, more or less, uh, findings on the neutron optics or the neutron wave particle behavior of uh, neutrons. And, and as you will see, uh, uh, what we will be discussing is that we'll be discussing mainly for us, at least within this lecture, the neutron is no more glio, uh, consisting of uh, gluons. For us, the neutron is the wave packet. And I will share with you some. So uh, as I mentioned it, please, this work is done within the framework of the UNESCO UNISA Africa Chair in uh, Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And uh, the mission of this uh, chair which is a trilateral partnership between the UNESCO, UNISA, and Itamba Labs. Its mission, major mission and vision, is to prepare workforce of tomorrow uh, with uh, highly multi skills uh, uh, and uh, diverse knowledge uh, to be absorbed by the, uh, how can I say, by the industry as well as by academia. And uh, uh, the training mainly is reinforced at the level of an MSc and PhD uh, of a number of students from different parts of the African continent. 
well, you'd have to admit that uh, the success of uh, uh, the success of this uh, uh, initiative has made it in a way that UNESCO advised us to open it for the not only to limit it to the to, uh, to Africa but to the south. That includes uh, uh, India, Pakistan, Iran, uh, and another countries from the south, uh, Brazil, for example, and Mexico. Well. Uh, our program uh, is a really forcefully uh, uh, focused on the gender also, and it has quite a number of uh, uh, fellows, uh, female fellows at the MSc and the PhD, as well as the postdocs from different parts of the continent, as well as uh, uh, the South. And uh, it's not, of course, limited to only uh, young scientists or emerging scientists uh, uh, through PhD and MSc and postdocs, but also to senior uh, colleagues who are interested to embark with us in the multidisciplinary field of nanosciences and nanotechnology that involves physics, chemistry, computational modeling, uh, engineering, and uh, mathematics. And uh, within it, there is a component of uh, mobility, scientific mobility, of senior scientists from different parts of the African continent. So the aim is to create the equivalent of the European human capital mobility to create the same thing in Africa via exchange of students and via uh, uh, joint visits and so on. And well, this, uh, how can I say, has allowed us to move really very fast and uh, to boost the, uh, um, the impact of uh, the African sciences uh, in the field of nanosciences and nanotechnology worldwide and to share the resources of the limited financial and the infrastructure resources. As by this typical example, as you can see, it's really rare to see uh, African scientists co-authoring papers together. And here, a typical example, whereby you have scientists from Senegal, from Lesotho, from Nigeria and South Africa and Cameroon together in, in, in a, such a kind of paper, for example. And uh, well, our research uh, uh, focus areas are in the field of nanomaterials for different applications uh, and both fundamental and applied in, uh, in energy, in photonics, in green processing, in biomimics, and of course, uh, in nanomaterials and radiation, radiations uh, related to accelerator as well as the neutron research reactors. And we have quite extensive amount of uh, uh, outputs uh, and those who are interested uh, to find out uh, more about our activities, they can contact me at this uh, email addresses. So we can send them the uh, five years and uh, uh, five years first term report of the UNESCO chair. And by that, uh, I will I'll go to the the, uh, the core component of this uh, lecture, that is the neutrons. Well, just to give an idea about uh, the basics of the neutron uh, physics, well, uh, neutron has been postulated in 1920 in New Zealand by uh, uh, Rutherford, and it was confirmed in the UK in 1923 by Chadwick. Well, and it happened that uh, uh, within that uh, period, uh, yeah, and up to now, the neutron is considered as the cornerstone of the standard model in a sense that it is very sensitive to the four different forces. And it happened that uh, as early as the 40s, uh, when the, with the beginning of uh, uh, the neutron research reactors in Brookhaven in particular, uh, uh, at, uh, also and after Atlantske in Los Alamos, uh, uh, Fermi, Enrico Fermi has observed the first optical wave behavior of, uh, of neutrons, that is the total reflection. We know that the total reflection is a proper two waves. And it happened that Fermi has observed the same thing when he sent the beam uh, impinging at a grazing incidence on a slab of a nickel, uh, and it was reflected, totally reflected. But the most beautiful experiment showing the wave part, the wave aspect of a neutron is in a, 
has has to wait until 1973 when Helmut Rauch uh, at the RT in the in Vienna has observed indeed the neutron interferometry. I would like just mention that uh, 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 Helmut Rauch was the 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 unique student of Erwin Schrödinger, and uh, well. Uh, Coming back to the gluonic nature of neutrons, well, as uh, we mentioned, and you are well far better than me in this field, is that the neutron is a major component of the standard model uh, because it's sensitive to the four forces and because the, the composition, the internal composition of each particle has to involve uh, a neutron to a certain extent. And uh, not only to the standard model, but also to the cosmology as a whole, because the neutron decay is a critical uh, component uh, in terms of uh, uh, the formation of the universe and the, for, uh, the early stage of, uh, uh, of it. And the lifetime of the free neutron before decaying to a proton, anti-electron and neutrino, that lifetime is the critical uh, in the field of cosmology as well as the as the early stage of the creation of the universe in the standard model we are aware uh, how the neutron decays and what type of interactions and the quark and it involves and so on uh, but again it's the neutron decay of a free neutrons uh, which is extremely important for understanding how much hydrogen, helium, and other light elements formed in the first few minutes after the universe was born 13.8 billion years ago. So in that regard, in that regard, quite a number of experiments, but two major type of uh, techniques are used, the bottle and the time flight tube uh, experiments uh, uh, are used to measure the time of flight, uh, the time life of a neutron, which is around 14, uh, 15, minutes approximately. And it happened that uh, these experiments by the bottle and uh, the time of light tube always give a difference. Even with their bar errors, they give always a difference uh, of around 39 seconds. And therefore there was a stipulation that there is a, a, a mirror space, a mirror word, whereby the neutrons goes and, uh, and comes back to the real world and so on. So. This is a fundamental, uh, these measurements and the precision in measuring that time of life is extremely critical. And well, in that regard, we will share, share with you a way more or less to have a, a high precision in terms of uh, 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 the neutron uh, lifetime measurements and hopefully combining the, the bottle technique or the time flight technique with the nanostructure system could shed light uh, uh, better on this lifetime of the neutron and therefore the cosmology impact and the, the, its impact on the uh, on the standard model. So I, I go to the major part now of the lecture. For us, as I mentioned uh, to your colleagues, uh, for us, from this, from this slide, downward, we will consider a neutron as a wave packet, as not a corpuscular. It's not, for us, it's not a gluonic nature. It is a wave packet from quantum mechanic, uh, uh, the neutron of a mass M with a velocity V uh, uh, can be considered as a wave packet uh, with the wavelength lambda given by the, the Boyle relation. And uh, how can I, if so, it has uh, uh, to, how can I say, a number of uh, wave behavior have to be observed. Indeed, the first one was by Enrico Fermi in 1946. That is the total reflection of a, new, a full neutron beam. The second one is the polarization from the, in terms of optical point of view. Uh, so that was uh, shown by Gukasov in 1954. And the thin film interference, uh, the early stage of uh, the interferometry by Meyer Leibniz in 62, and after by the prism deflection, the standard one that was by Landkammer and Corpion 
But the most beautiful one was the Helmut Rauch, who was the interferometry. And there was a quite a number of other quantum mechanic phenomena showing clearly the, the, the wave packet or the wave nature of the neutron. But as I mentioned, the most genuine and beautiful one was done by the student of Erwin Schrödinger, that is Helmut Rauch in Vienna, whereby he took a, a resonator, silicon-based uh, resonator, which, ha which has the configuration of the standard Maxander optical interferometer with the beam coming uh, splitted uh, by the first uh, uh, silicon uh, uh, phase split it into paths and at the, at the detectors, both detectors, the O and the H, we observe interference phenomena, as you can see on the right side here. This is a clear, uh, uh, how can I say, it's a clear proof of the wave nature of the neutron. And well, it happened that uh, 40 years after uh, the, the, how can I say, this observation that uh, 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 Nobel Prize was awarded to Cliff Schull uh, and his colleague uh, Brooke House uh, 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 from Canada and the US. Let me please go to uh, other, sorry, I have to stress on the fact that the wave particle behavior of a neutron is, may, is uh, seen easily between brackets with cold neutrons and thermal neutrons. It can be observed by other neutrons, but that, how can I say, the resolution and the intensity is not high enough. And um, we cannot design easily the materials which can, for, with the, which we can observe this uh, quantum mechanic behavior with these uh, neutrons, ultra-fast neutrons, uh, uh, resonance neutrons, slow neutrons, and so on. But with the cold neutrons and thermal neutrons, yes, up to now, it's possible to sit there. How we may, how we produce these cold neutron thermal neutrons, we are obliged to have uh, nuclear research reactors. And well, the experiments that I will be sharing with you, that I will show you, uh, have been made uh, uh, at the Laboratoire Léon Brillouin uh, in, uh, using the reactor Orphe at the Commissariat à l'énergie atomique at the Atomic Energy Corporation of France. Well, Within that, what we have within the, uh, the, the reactor at the bottom here, we have quite a number of ports and there is uh, the, uh, the thermal uh, neutron beam here at the source. The neutron uh, are thermalized. They become uh, through a, a wall of deuterium oxide uh, water. And after thermalized either uh, through a helium, a helium or uh, 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 or uh, hydrogen or carbon moderators, and they come thermalized at the, uh, at the entrance, at the exit. And from that exit, the, how can I say, we use what we call uh, neutron guides, tunnels, using total reflection of, uh, uh, discovered by Fermi, to conduct these cold neutrons far from the reactor itself. And uh, how can I say, what we call, generally speaking, uh, uh, neutron guide hall, and uh, uh, these uh, neutrons are used for a number of uh, other techniques which require uh, such a cold or thermal neutrons, like neutron reflectometry, for example, where we study this phenomena, quantum mechanic phenomena that I will share with you, and the small angle neutron scattering for uh, other studies, as, as well as a spin echo type uh, fundamental studies. But the experiment that I will be sharing with you have been done more or less within this uh, reflectometer here. Well, as I mentioned, for us, the neutron is not, the, the gluonic nature of the neutron is not considered here. It's the wave packet. And uh, by the direct uh, notation, we have, uh, the bra of that uh, uh, wave function of the neutron given by that is a proposition of a number of uh, plane waves. And uh, uh, the interaction uh, with the matter is described by the potential VR according to the uh, Schrodinger equation. 
and we have to combine it in a way to put it in a form uh, uh, in a form of uh, an equation which is related to optics uh, to classical optics or classical electromagnetism so we put it in a form of Helmholtz equation whereby the uh, kr is the momentum uh, in the medium dependent wave vector and it's given by this expression where the VR is the Fermi potential. And uh, well, uh, dividing the, the medium wave dependent wave vector relatively to the, its equivalent in, uh, in air or in a vacuum, we have the ratio which is the refractive index. Therefore, the refractive index is given by this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, formula. And it happened that VR is of the order of 10 to minus five. So therefore this term here can be, uh, this uh, formula can be approximated to that. And therefore for us, for, for us an interaction of uh, a neutron wave packet with the matter is described by the ref a refractive index given by this expression and simply said, was, well, we can neglect whatever we saw before, simply said, uh, for us, uh, classically, or how can a standard approach is that the neutron is scattered by different nuclei and so on and so on. But for us, in terms of uh, wave nature of the neutron, we consider the neutron as the equivalent of a wave packet. And that uh, the discontinuous medium which was, uh, how can I say, the discontinuous medium with which the neutron interacts via the Fermi potential is equivalent, is transformed to a continuous medium described by a refractive index N, given by the previous formula that we saw. So for us, in the wave, in terms of wave packet, the neutron interacts with any matter via the, uh, how can I say, through this refractive index here. And this refractive index, of course, lambda is the De Broglie wave lambda associated to the neutron, N is the density, uh, is related to the density of the material, which is the number of scattering center by vo uh, per unit volume. And B here is the scattering length amplitude uh, of, the, of the material, and the rest is uh, uh, the, uh, related to the absorption. So B here is extremely important. That is, how can I say, it is the one which they will define to us what is material transparent to the neutrons, what is the material which is uh, uh, refle uh, reflector to the neutrons, and what is the material which can which uh, absorb material. So B here is extremely important, colleagues, and stop me if uh, if you need, but I would like really you to stress on the fact of the importance of B and that the fact that this term here is small, is around 10 to minus four to 10 to minus six. So therefore the refractive index and here is always close to one. And therefore to see the optical behavior or the wave behavior of neutrons, you have to impinge your beam and the grazing incidence, oh, sorry, and the grazing incidence, which means an angle here of the order of a degree. So you have to have a very uh, highly collimated beams and so on. And that's why uh, these kind of experiments are very difficult or are challenging. But the B here is extremely important colleagues. There is a B which is the coherent scattering length in Fermi uh, units uh, by contrast to X-rays and uh, uh, other techniques, this B here uh, changes in an irregular way. Uh, the most important thing is that this B here can be positive for the bulk of materials and can be negative. For those for which the B is negative, these materials are transparent to neutrons. The neutrons can wave packet they can go through. While those, uh, those who are, have a, a positive B, they are highly reflectors. 
in particular the nickel. Nickel is a highly reflecting material. So as you can see, the B is positive and very high. And it happens that the, one of the highest reflectors of neutrons, thermal neutrons and cold neutrons, is the nickel 58, the isotope 58. As you can see for the B uh, titanium, the B is negative, uh, so it's transparent. So is uh, isotope, uh, another isotope also, which is negative. Vanadium also, manganese also. You can also see that uh, the dysprosium has a higher uh, uh, coherent scattering length than nickel, but unfortunately dysprosium as the bulk of the majority of the rare earth, the, the, its cross section of absorption is very high. So we, sh we avoid to use this in neutron optics. So we prefer to use the, the best is the nickel 58 or nickel to, uh, to cool. Because the, how can I say, uh, the bulk of uh, nickel, uh, uh, natural nickel contains a large amount of nickel 58. So generally speaking, in the future, in, uh, uh, in the future slides, as you will see, we will use mainly nickel as the highest reflector material and the titanium or vanadium, titanium or vanadium here as the transparent materials. Please stop me uh, uh, if, uh, if it's not clear. So for, Sir, uh, yes. I just wanted to find out uh, why, why, why nickel is the best one when you have other elements that have a higher um, um, scattering length, um, scattering uh, value, like scandium. Yes, yes. Like scandium, scandium there. Scandium, correct. But this element, generally speaking, if you go to the, how can I say, uh, uh, first of all, if you go to uh, uh, the the data uh, base, you will find out the scandium has a, a high uh, amplitude, the coherent scattering length amplitude, but it has a high incoherence, okay? Because the B, sorry, uh, the coherent scattering length, uh, the B consists of a coherent part plus an incoherent part, as well as uh, 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 absorption part. Generally speaking, uh, the elements uh, who have uh, uh, a high uh, coherent, like scandium, for example, have do possess a, 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 a significant and coherent part. So we prefer not to use the incoherent part. Uh, in addition to that, uh, other elements like uh, ytterbium, uh, mercury, and so on, and dysprosium they have or osmium, they have a high uh, cross section of absorption. So we try not to use them. In addition to that, in terms of cost, uh, nickel is cost effective, the others not. I hope that I responded uh, uh, to your uh, question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, uh, relatively and rightfully as mentioned by uh, our colleague who asked the question here, uh, to choose the right elements uh, uh, as a good reflector or as a transparent material or as an absorber, we are obliged to go to the database of uh, the Farley Sears from uh, Chalk River in, the, in Canada database, uh, which was in effect, which gives us all the amplitude, uh, the coherent uh, scattering amplitudes being coherent or incoherent at the cross section of absorption and so on at different wavelengths and so on. So we go to this database for the choice of the right materials. Well, as you can see here for the titanium, we go for it because the coherent uh, scattering amplitude is negative and it's quite uh, large, but negative. And uh, for the, so is for the vanadium. We go also for the vanadium because the, uh, it has, a, sorry, it has a negative one, it's like transparent. And uh, for the nickel, we go for the nickel because it has a high positive amplitude, generally speaking. 
And well, I would like, if you allow me, please, to just to give, and maybe I am going through basics here, but it's a really necessary, please forgive me uh, uh, for uh, such. Uh, I am obliged to do so. If we have a slab of any material, if we send a beam under grazing incidence, if you remember we said the refractive index is close to one. As for X-rays, therefore, the angle of incidence here has to be very small, less than a degree. Uh, and this is a challenging technical aspect of a neutron uh, optics. So if we send a beam under, of a neutron wave packet under such an incidence, there will be a part which will be reflected, and there will be a part which will be transmitted, and a part which will be absorbed. But generally speaking, for any uh, the general material in neutron optics, we, when we measure the reflectivity, we see that the reflectivity profile uh, versus the wavelength or wave versus the wave. If we have uh, a white beam, we measure it versus the wavelength. If we have a, a fixed monochromatic beam, we change the angle theta. And uh, in both cases, we can uh, bring it to the momentum four pi sun theta over lambda. And the profile that we will have is given by, generally speaking, when we, uh, generally speaking, it has this profile here. There is a plateau of reflection, and this is extremely important. The, front, the plateau of reflection, which is 100% of the beam which is reflected, in particular for nickel, or nickel 58, and uh, the, uh, we call it the total reflection plateau. This is exactly what was observed in 1942, I think, by uh, Thomas Fermi. Uh, and we have the vitreous region, which gives us an idea about what is happening on the surface. We are not interested by the vitreous region. We are interested by the total reflection plateau. And here, please, colleagues, the total reflection plateau, the reflectivity is 100%, is one. So this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, this uh, neutron that we, uh, uh, this, this total reflection is used to bring the code neutrons uh, from the neutron reactor core uh, uh, to the neutron guide hole, whereby number of spectrometers are mounted, uh, like the spinico, as I mentioned, the small angle neutron scattering, uh, and the reflectometry and other techniques. Uh, and uh, it happened that to do that, you have to bring to use uh, what we call uh, neutron guides. There are now in any uh, neutron uh, research reactor, you find them. And they act like a fiber optics. The neutrons are bouncing by total reflection inside the tube until uh, reaching the the spectrophotometer, whereby we use monochromata boom, to bring them out, and we, how can I say, we use whatever required tech, uh, uh, infrastructure to run the experiments. But these ones are the cold and the thermal neutrons, which use this total reflection. Now, colleagues, we go to the typical first example. Uh, in terms of first example, let's consider a quantum well consisting of a nickel barrier, uh, two nickel barriers uh, separated by a vanadium. Uh, nickel, if you remember colleagues, is a highly reflecting material. So is the, this nickel layer here. And the vanadium has a negative coherent length, so it's transparent, if you remember. So in terms of a thin film, film structure, what we do, we have a, a thin film, first thin film of nickel deposited on silicon wafer. On the top of this nickel here, we have a layer of vanadium, natural vanadium. On the top of this uh, uh, vanadium uh, layer, we have a nickel layer. And uh, what we do, we prepare it in a way that the thickness of uh, the nickel and uh, this layer and this layer of nickels relatively to the spacer, the, uh, the vanadium, 
their uh, thicknesses are calculated through this, uh, what we call a fabry perot resonator condition. This is a fabry perot resonator. So we take them in a way that these thicknesses are, do verify these resonance conditions. In this case, for the refractive index for neutrons of nickel and titanium, and uh, vanadium, sorry, we find that the nickel has to be uh, of the order of, uh, its thickness has to be of the order of 200 angstroms. And uh, so is this one. And this one is 1000 angstroms. Uh, colleagues, just to have an idea clearly, is that uh, uh, if we send the neutron, normally, because the nickel is a highly reflecting material, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we said, highly reflecting material, therefore, if we send the beam and a small incidence, it will be fully reflected. Correct, colleagues? Hello, colleagues, is it uh, right what I am stating? Yes. Thank you. It's exactly what we said. And, and how can I say, but, but if we consider, if we consider this uh, resonance condition, uh, the neutron will not be fully reflected in some, uh, for some, uh, for some wavelength or for some, uh, yeah, for some wavelength if we use a fixed angle it will leak through this layer here and it will go through the transparent layer and come reach this layer and it can either bounce and bounce back, bounce back and go and it will leak again and come out. This, if, if it is the case, that means, uh, that means the neutron, uh, the neutron, uh, uh, the neutron has tunneled. Otherwise, we will not see anything in the transmission. So, if we do the experiment, colleagues, this is the transmission. This is the transmission profile. And this is the reflection profile. The total reflection plateau normally, if all went uh, as uh, theoretically predicted, uh, it, we should have had a total reflection as is like this. But colleagues, you, you note that uh, in the total reflection plateau, we have dips here. One, two, three, four, five, because this, this is the critical wavelength. This is the critical momentum. And you can see that for this, for each resonance here in the, for each dip in the reflection, there is a, a peak somehow in the transmission. This one for that, this one for that, this one for that, and that one for that and so on. And this one for the last one for this. What does it mean colleagues? That means uh, at this wavelength exactly, because we have used the white beam, a more polychromatic beam. For this wavelength, the resonance condition was verified at 100%. And therefore, the wave packet, the neutron has tunneled via the, the nickel instead to be fully reflected, but it has tunneled and went to reach the other layer and came out because we see it in the transmission. And uh, therefore, we clearly see that indeed the neutron have tunneled through this and the tunneling took uh, place and that uh, the neutron behaved like a wave particle, uh, sorry, like a wave. And it has, uh, it has, uh, it has behaved like a wave and therefore it, it sensed, uh, it behaved like, uh, or it went through what we call frustrated total reflection in classical optics. So we have clearly shown that there are dips in the, in the reflection. That means these, were, these neutrons have tunneled, reaching the second one. They have also tunneled 
to be observed by detector here, both here and here we measured the reflection where there was nothing and the, the, those where nothing have been uh, uh, transmitted. Well, what are the consequences of this tunneling? It's not because, it's not only that uh, the neutron has a tunneled uh, and uh, be, it has behaved like a wave uh, packet and therefore it confirmed the wave nature of the neutron according to quantum mechanics. It's not only that, no, 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 no. It is far than that. If it has tunneled, uh, the neutron wave packet has uh, reached the transparent material uh, layer, which is the vanadium. And therefore, uh, it has reached that, and it has reached the second one, the second nickel layer, that uh, nickel reflector. Therefore, it would certainly resonate. It will be reflected. It will reach the second, the first one. It will be reflected. Therefore, these modes of resonance that you observe uh, in the reflection plateau, uh, how can I say, they are in fact related to resonances of the neutron packet inside the resonator. And at a certain moment, they will come out. And naturally, naturally, there will be one which will make one reflection, two reflection, three, three reflection, and come out. The other one will make five reflection and it will come out. The first one will not make any reflection. It will come out. So this reason, this, uh, uh, this wave packet that you are observing at the bottom here, uh, the detector in transmission, they give us an idea about how long time this neutron wave packet spent in the resonator. And therefore, according to Schrodinger equation, uh, according to Heisenberg and Centainty, from the width at the half maximum of these weeks, of these peaks, of these resonances, we are able to, to, uh, to determine how much time the neutron wave packet has spent in the resonator. And therefore, using the wave, the Centainty Heisenberg, uh, the Heisenberg and Centainty, it is possible to get an idea about how much, how long the neutron spent. And you would see that uh, uh, the can neutron, I, sorry? Can I please ask a question about the previous slide? Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. So, um, it, it, from a basic physics that I know about, um, uh, yes. uh, so it's optics, is that uh, the angle of incidence of of of, of a beam is is equal to is equal to the, the 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 reflected angle, right? Is this the case also inside in, inside the correct? The, yes, the so then, Descartes, Yes, the Snellius Descartes is verified. Yes, you're right. So then, doesn't doesn't the angle of incidence before it, it it tunnels out of it tunnels it tunnels through the nickel the nickel layer have to be small enough? Yes, okay. yes. In effect, this you are right. In effect, this is the schematic uh, uh, form of. Uh, it's not really very precise. The angle of incidence here is 0 0.5 degrees. The refracted beam will be a little bit here, the refracted beam here will be different, of course. But yeah. uh, how can I say, Bec but because the refractive index or, of the nickel or, and uh, in the vanadium, they are close to one, if you remember. Yeah. Huh? yeah. You remember? Yeah. So the difference is really small. The most important thing here is, how can I say, is that the beam will resonate uh, many times, uh, the beam will resonate, before the wave packet will resonate before coming out. And these resonances that we see, they correspond to different resonances. Uh, and the one who will, the wave packet who will resonate, who will stay longer time in the resonator is this one, is the one which, is, which corresponds to highest wavelengths. Okay. Okay, and these are the ones that we are looking for. 
we want to have we would like to have uh, uh, a neutron spending as much time as possible in the resonator to be able to measure its lifetime. Huh? And therefore, we need to have, uh, we have, we need to have uh, these resonances at a higher wavelength. But unfortunately, in the current uh, neutron research reactors, the wave, the wavelength, the higher wavelength are not easy to get because the background is huge because the the flux is limited so therefore the unique way is to go to wait until the ess will operate the ess is, is the uh, european spallation source neutron source in sweden therefore once such a reactor will operate so therefore we will have uh, high fluxes around 10 to 18 and it is there where we will be able to have uh, a large uh, how can i say high intensity in the largest wavelengths here and therefore to be able to uh, uh, trap neutrons for a longer time in the resonator here inside uh, is it uh, Clear, colleagues? Yes, that, yes. That, that's clear. Yes. Very clear. Thank Very you. Clear. Thank you. So, so uh, how can I say, waiting for the ESS to, uh, to come in and so on, uh, it is uh, still important that, uh, how can I say, uh, within this example, we are not, uh, we are not, uh, uh, stating that uh, this could replace the bottle experiment or the time of flight tube experiment uh, at the NIST or, or at Los Alamos or TLL or in Japan, in Japan Proton Accelerator Research Complex in Tokai. No, we are not telling. What we are telling here is that we could combine with the cold neutrons, we can combine both this, the bottle or the time of flight linear uh, way of measuring with the with the, a nanostructure device to be able to have uh, a high precision on the time flight and the lifetime of the neutron. And therefore, to be able to respond to this existence of uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, or in parallel space or other theoretical uh, uh, kind of predictions. So uh, it is hoped that this uh, uh, experiment will take place. We are in uh, discussion with our colleagues from Uppsala and the colleagues from NIST uh, about this potential experiment in future. Well, in effect, uh, uh, in effect, uh, this uh, uh, tunneling with the nanoscaled Fabry-Perot resonators can be extended. To, uh, to play on the polarization of the neutron itself. So to play on the Zeeman effect. And this, uh, for example, uh, this uh, profile shows us that when we play on the spin of the neutron, playing it, uh, I can say, play, playing on it very well, we have resonator, we have resonances for spin up and spin down. We can also play on the isotope nature and here, for example, in the plateau of reflection, total reflection, we can see clearly in this uh, uh, experiment run by, uh, how can I say, an MSc student in effect, whereby we see clearly uh, resonances in, uh, uh, in an isotope-based resonator. So it, and for uh, uh, far uh, deeper literature, it's possible to go colleagues, uh, and I can send you uh, the literature if you need be, but you can read this. And we have published all the presented work in a series of papers uh, uh, with the colleagues. And also uh, uh, we have uh, uh, published this in, uh, uh, in a physics report, an impact factor for around 25, if I don't uh, remember, uh, and a series of uh, publication physics letter A. The second one, if you allow me, uh, 
dear chair, how long, how many times I have still? Dr. KTV? Yes, yes, um, I am looking. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, you, you have, um, I think you have about 10 minutes and then we go into question and answer session. But, Thank you. But please uh, go ahead. If you yes. take a little bit longer. Thank you. Fine. That's okay. I will try to keep in time. Colleagues, the second one that I would like to share with you is uh, 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 to allow uh, to prepare a system and design a system in a way to see in a beautiful manner, in a very beautiful way, uh, uh, the, the wave nature of the neutron. You know, uh, there is a saying, in Allah Jamilun wa Hibbul Jamal in Arabic. God is beautiful and He likes beauty. And what I would like to share with you, colleagues, is really the beauty in neutron physics. One of the facets, of course. You are well aware that uh, uh, boron is uh, a highly absorbing material. It has very large, not the largest absorption cross section, but it is a, it has a high absorption cross section of the order of 200 bars, bars for thermal neutrons and cold neutrons. And in fact, uh, uh, there are many other elements who are have a high uh, absorption cross section, but the cheaper one is boron. And the one that um, we make easily is the boron carbide. And uh, you are aware that uh, to control the nuclear fission in neutron research reactors, we use bars of uh, 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 bar rods, rods of uh, uh, boron in the neutron reactor to stop or minimize the, to control the nuclear fission. Well, and of course, uh, the other application of boron is the nuclear therapy. But uh, let me, how can I say, colleagues, mention uh, that uh, here uh, that uh, boron indeed, it has uh, one of the highly absorbing material, uh, cheaper, uh, easy to fabricate relatively to others, and less toxic relatively to others. And here the cross-section colleagues, as you can see, it's maybe the smallest, but it is not uh, negligible. And here, the same thing, colleagues, uh, the thermal, the cross section of absorption, the absorption cross section for thermal neutrons, where we are concerned here, and it's around 200, followed by cadmium and xenon and uh, indium. Uh, well, what we wanted to do is to show this uh, phenomena with boron because it's easy to make boron carbide. Well, if we take a slab of boron carbide, normally if we send a beam uh, of, pro of neutrons, there would be no reflection and no transmission, but full absorption. Because the boron, the natural boron, consists of 20% of boron 10. And boron 10 has a cross section for thermal neutrons of around 200 bonds. It's huge. It's a huge. So it will be, there would be neutron capture here. Well, colleagues, yes, okay, fine. Let us use the boron carbide uh, slab, thin films in the form of a nanostructure. And let's show that in some conditions, the neutron sees a transparent boron carbide it will see an open gate here. The boron becomes transparent to the thermal neutrons. Let us do, colleagues, as St. Thomas, we believe what we see. Well, just to stress on the fact that boron is a highly absorbing element among, uh, among the light elements, it is used extensively, as I mentioned, in the control road bus in the power water research reactors. And it is by, it's an element used 
by excellence in proton, uh, proton boron therapy. What we have, we send we, in the cell, we have a boron nuclei and uh, we send a neutron. There is a reaction here. It, uh, that the reaction gives us lithium and helium and a strong gamma ray radiation, which is so strong that it kills any tumor inside the cell here. Well, I'm gonna say just to show again, colleagues, how much the boron tan, which is uh, around 20% in the natural boron, is uh, absorbing. Now, here we have to go to a special configuration. Instead to take one resonator, we will go for many resonators. Let's then try to find, to ensure that uh, the boron would, uh, would absorb that the probability that this support, that's a neutron which would come under this grazing incidence, it will be absorbed at certain amount by one of the boron uh, layers here, the black ones, uh, separated by transparent material. Well, if we take uh, such a multi-resonator, what we call a multi-layer, we take silicon glass, a silicon wafer, we deposit on it a first layer of titanium. Remember titanium colleagues has a negative uh, amp uh, amplitude of uh, uh, coherent uh, scattering amplitude. It has a negative one. So it transparents for neutrons. But the boron is, uh, has a, a positive scattering amplitude, but a huge cross section of absorption. So it's in black here and so on and so on and we take another resonator and so on and so on and so on. We can take 10 of these resonators or nine or 25 or 50, as you wish. Start with nine at the beginning, nine bilayers. A bilayer is uh, this, uh, an absorbing layer plus transparent, an absorbing layer plus transparent, absorbing layer plus transparent, and so on and so on. So from the uh, gluonic part nature of the neutron, neutrons has a size of 0 0.2 bonds. The boron tan has a, a, a cross section of around 200 bonds. Colleagues, probabilistically wise, uh, you would understand that this boron has no chance to come to go through. No, we cannot see that behavior we have again to come back to the wave nature of the neutron. So if this neutron is tackling this multi-layer multi -layer system consisting of boron carbide absorbing layer, boron carbide absorbing layer separated by transparent titanium, normally if it's not absorbed by the first one, it will be absorbed by the second one and so on and so on. And colleagues, let's really uh, do it uh, in a way that instead to use a fabri perot structure, we have to prepare our system that in a way that the, the, the system, the thicknesses here of the boron carbide and the titanium are governed by the zeldovich vinogradov equations. And this zeldovich vinogradov came with this uh, uh, approach for X-rays, hard X-rays. But because the X-rays, uh, have, have their behavior is uh, uh, with the materials, their refractive index is close to one. It's like uh, for the neutrons, one month delta. So which means that uh, the Breuil nature, uh, the Breuil uh, quantum mechanic obliges with the uh, uh, parallelism with the X-rays. Therefore, if we consider the zeldovich vinogradov uh, equation and the uh, conditions for neutrons, we will be able to have uh, uh, a neutron resonating in an absorbing multilayered system, doesn't matter. Therefore, when we do our calculations and we take into consideration the zeldovich vinogradov equation, we find out in the case of titanium, under this angle of uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.1 degree Celsius, uh, sorry, one degree, we find out that the layers that we have, the thickness of the titanium must be of 12 
nanometers, and the boron carbide must be of the order of two nanometers. So we, make the, we made three samples of this to ensure that the reproducibility and that the zeldovich Vinogradov also applies for uh, uh, neutrons, wave packets. So we have synthesized this uh, uh, multilayers of an extremely high quality. I would like to mention that the quality of this, to see this, multi, this phenomena, you are obliged to control uh, the thickness of your layer, your layer at the angstrom, at the atom level precision. And for as such, there was only one place to be done. That is Institute of Optique Theorique uh, Applique in France. And this is the one which supplies NASA uh, and the JAXA, the Japan Space Agency, as well as NASA for all its mirrors. All, I strictly mention, all their mirrors are made by this uh, group at Institute Optique. Well, please colleagues, let's have it clear. When we send an angle, when we send the beam under a certain angle of one degree, that is 10 to minus two radiant. So if the neutron travels a film, a boron carbide of a thickness of two nanometers, in effect, it travels a path in the boron carbide, not of two nanometers, but uh, of 200, nanome uh, 200 nanometers. Because it's two nanometers divided by 10 to minus two radiant. So that means it's 10 to five Fermi. Remember, the size of the, the neutron is a Fermi. And therefore, the neutron in terms of uh, particle aspect, if it has to go through a thick a material with a thickness of around 10 to 5 Fermi, it is likely, colleagues, to be absorbed. In this case, colleagues, no, no. So, in this case, what would happen if the, mater the materials behaves like as it is not absorbing? The boron carbide behaves like as if it is not absorbing if we make, if we consider geometry uh, governed by the, by the Zeldovich Vinogradov, using a highly absorbing material and separated by transparent material. What we would have colleagues is that in the case of Zeldovich Vinogradov, it will tell us, yes, it will, uh, uh, it will go through and there will be a reflection even from the bottom through all the different layers here. And this beam, these different beams reflected at each interface will give us what we call a Bragg diffraction. All this at each interface we have a reflection. You will have a reflection, optically speaking, whenever you have an interface between two different medium with a refractive index N1 and N2, which is the case. And in addition, it tells us that uh, 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 you would have a Bragg diffraction and you would have, uh, if there is an interference between this first beam reflected at the first interface and the last interface, which means this beam here, if this beam interfer uh, interfere with this beam, we would have what we call Kiesig fringes. Colleagues, this is exactly what we obtain it. This is exactly what we obtained. Here, we have obtained the Bragg peak. This Bragg peak here, it is related to the interference between all these peaks reflected by different interfaces. All of them, this is what optics tells us. Absorbing or not absorbing, this is what it tells us. You can't have a Bragg peak without this interference. And this is exactly what we have. And the reflection maybe is not 100%, but it is 12.4%. This is high. In addition to that, colleagues, we have an interference between this peak and this peak, uh, this beam and this beam. That is the Kiesig fringes, as you can see here, colleagues. This is a crystal clear that this beam came and hasn't had an interference with this beam here this first one. 
Therefore, colleagues, that means the neutron has not behaved as a gluonic uh, nature, but as a wave packet, which went through and have been reflected partially at each interface by the absorbing layer, yes. We can state and we can confirm that. And better than that, this was in the case of a, a, fill, a multi layer with nine bilayers. One, two, but one bilayer, nine bilayers. If we take 25 bilayers, we observe nearly the same thing. If we take we, uh, 50 bilayers, we have the, the same thing. And colleagues, please, you just can calculate 50 bilayers. That means 50 layers of, uh, of uh, boron carbide each of two uh, uh, nanometers thickness, 50 times 50, uh, two times 50, that means a thickness of 100 nanometers, that is 10 to 7 Fermi. A neutron of a Fermi size, in size, has traversed, has, the, has uh, uh, it went through, traveled through 10 to 7 Fermi, thickness of boron carbide. That what does it mean, colleagues? And that means that the neutron here does not behave like a, a gluon type a particle, but as a wave particle. Uh, and in that regard, we have published a series of uh, papers, colleagues. And believe it or not, it's only recently that I have been asked to submit a paper in science for this for these results, it was neglected. We have presented it long time ago in Russia, but it wasn't. It has not attracted interest. It's only now that colleagues said, "Now you should really submit a, a contribution to Science a Magazine." Well, in that regard, colleagues, I wish to thank you in Delibua. Shukran, merci, and thank you for all those uh, who, of you who took uh, your time to listening to listen to this uh, contribution from us. And I wish really to thank our, uh, uh, our funders, the NRF, the South African government, and the number of agencies overseas, the German DAD, the uh, Swedish ISP, and the Italian and the ICTP and TWAS. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Uh, <clears throat> Shokran Mal uh, Malik. That you, was uh, uh, very good. I myself learned a lot about uh, neutron uh, transport and scattering. So this is really uh, it's nice and refreshing for some of us who are not in this field to really listen to these talks and broaden our perspectives. So um, we're going to have some time for discussion. So I would like to ask if. Uh, um, people uh, have any questions or any comments? Uh, uh, one of the things I can say is that you can see that a number of these things are connected. So it's a neutron transport, neutron scattering, therefore neutron acceleration. And it has many applications, like Malik said, in uh, uh, reactor technology and as well as uh, in, in medicine. So it's really nice to see. So comments or questions? So just maybe as a, a comment, so if there's no, or by the time that the student can uh, formulate as well some questions. So this is Christina from the ESS. So, Annie, so thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It really resonates a lot with uh, what we're trying to, to achieve as well in Sweden. So now we're even more ready, I think, and motivated to make sure that it will be there in due time. So by 2023. And it's, uh, it's good as well to see that there's a lot of uh, yeah, lesson learns as well from the LLB. And maybe my question would be like, uh, so you, you are intending as well, or are you involved as well with Freya or Estia or the different instruments that are being prepared in Sweden at the ESS, are there specific um, uh, study that you intend to, to contribute to as well? Uh, 
Thank you, Christine. In effect, uh, uh, since the laboratoire Lyon Brillouin has closed, uh, uh, and it's really tough to have a beam time at ELL. And uh, since my colleagues at uh, Institute Optique uh, uh, moved, all of them retired. So uh, 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 I find it a little bit difficult to follow up, but uh, uh, I have interacted uh, uh, with the director of uh, uh, the ESS when he visited us here in South Africa, and I have really expressed uh, our interest in embarking with colleagues from the ESS. Uh, so uh, I will be delighted uh, to, uh, I do come in a regular way to uh, Uppsala. Uh, so uh, uh, I would be delighted uh, to interact with colleagues of yours who are involved in this. There are quite a number of experiments and uh, projects to be uh, to, to, to be run on neutron reflectometry and neutron optics in general, and we are ready. We are ready. In effect, in South Africa, we are current next. We are currently running a series of uh, a mini symposium, uh, mini symposia on neutron scattering, and uh, to try uh, with the colleagues from ESS to find out uh, how South Africa can. Uh, uh, collaborate with colleagues at ESS. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I do run some experiments at Dubna uh, on the uh, reflex, reflectometer. But uh, we are open to embark with the uh, colleagues from ESS at any time. In effect, I'm ready from yesterday. Excellent. So, so this is really good to, to see that it converts as well, because indeed for the reflectometry, it might not be the first experiment to be started. And as you said, with the closing of the LLB, so there's a lot of things that could still be prepared, definitely. And I know that with the brightness too as well, there are different uh, uh, plans so that we could, yeah, yeah, try to, to combine those efforts and make something very useful for the future. So thanks a yeah. lot for, for all of that. And, and if you don't mind, so I will use as well this presentation like uh, one Please. of the, yeah, the presentation to be added as well at the ESS. I think it's very motivating. Please, very please, very thank you. You're very more welcome. And I hope that you, uh, uh, you will accept our invitation to visit us in South Africa. We will cover all the costs. We will be delighted to, uh, to host you here once this pandemic is out. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah, we had as well with, um, so it was two years ago, I think uh, there was already a visit for some of my colleagues. Huh? And I Correct. would try to, to foresee as well with them what are the, the, the connection and how to follow up on any activities. It's very important. Yes, yes. yes. In effect, uh, Christine, uh, we are, uh, as I mentioned, we are running symposia uh, relatively more or less uh, uh, to neutron scattering and to encourage the community to be uh, to come with the proposals for ESS and uh, uh, in effect in all these projects a number of uh, fellows are trained youngsters because South Africa will embark in uh, building a new research reactor Safari 2 whereby we are intending to have uh, how can I say to have a number of fellows trained in, in, um, in small angle neutron scattering techniques in particular. So you see, this is, that is very important and interesting as well for our students to know about those different opportunities as well, because there we could see or we could hear that potentially also you have some good candidate for those fellowships. Correct. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. In effect, uh, in effect uh, some of the fellows uh, who do come uh, to visit us uh, are from are funded by the ISP, the International Swedish Program, both in physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ISP was uh, the founder of uh, our program ASP in the past. So they have changed the director now. So we don't know how they how it will be for ASP, but uh, they are they, they do have a lot of good program on the continent. So it's nice to see that. Uh, um, they are supporting your efforts, Malik. Yes, yes, I do sit on the committee 
Uh-huh. So uh, ISP, so that's why I come in a regular way to Uppsala. You are okay. more than welcome. I will be delighted to assist you in any way that I can. Ah, that's good. It's nice to know. I'll come back to you again. Please do uh, so. Later for that. Please, uh, please, please. Yeah. I would like to hear if this, uh, you know, uh, ASP alumni is uh, connected, have questions. Um, I think this is for you guys. So it'd be nice if, if you guys can talk or ask any question. Uh, I have uh, one or two questions. All right. Yes, sir. I can't, can't really see the slide number, but then it's a, a slide with the the the, the, Bor- the, the, the Boron Gates. Um, Aha, yes, let me just. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to find out if the, um, the reflected neutrons, neutrons um, that come from, that, that, that are reflected off the, 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 the boron layers and the weakly yes. absorbing material at the bottom. Do they form some sort of uh, like interference pattern, like similar to what um, the like double slits experiment would, 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 would do? Yes, as I mentioned, do you see the transparent? Here what we have, we have a Bragg peak. Yeah. This Bragg this, uh, uh, Bragg peak order one. This is order two. And uh, these Bragg peaks are related to the diffraction, uh, to, the, to the interference between the reflected beams at each interface. It, uh, one should remember that the neutron wave packet here, it does see a medium, the boron carbide, as a, a, a medium with the real part and an imaginary part. The real part, the real part reflects and the imaginary part uh, absorbs. What I have not mentioned, I am really, thank you so much for coming back to this transparency. Thank you so much, Colin. Uh, so this, because it, there is a real part uh, uh, of the boron carbide, therefore uh, there will, uh, uh, there will be a reflection at each interface because there is a ch- there is a difference in the reflective in the, uh, the real part. There will be a reflection here between the titanium and the boron carbide here between the. Uh, Sorry, the titanium. What, what what parameter does the real part correspond to? Uh, in, in the B, remember oh, the, the B? B. Okay, yeah. yeah okay. The B. Yeah. Yes, in the B. And yeah. to explain this uh, phenomena, the Zeldovich Vinogradov geometry uh, allowed us to prepare the, wa- the wave packet in a way that uh, the wave which will be reflected at each interface, okay, and as well at the end, the two always like this. Uh, colleague, uh, I am grateful to the gentleman who asked this question. In effect, we prepare a way, the wave in a way that it will resonate at each layer, each layer in a way the maximum of amplitude of the resonating layer in each uh, uh, resonator, the maximum corresponds of the uh, interference corresponds to the transparent layer and the minimum corresponds to the absorbing layer. So the maximum of interference at this second resonator corresponds to the, is in the transparent layer, while the minimum of interference, there is nothing to absorb, corresponds to absorbing layer and so on and so on and so on. That is why in the Zeldovich Vinogradov geometry, this works very well. This is why the X-ray lasers are no more a dream. It will be a reality. This is why ITER is not a dream, but a reality, because this geometry of materials that we use in this kind of uh, systems. Because this resonance, because the minima of resonances are always uh, fitting with the absorbing material, 
So the absorbing material can be held as an absorbing material. What it absorb? It absorb the minimum. So mm -hmm. it's not uh, of an interest for uh, for the wave uh, particle. So that is why uh, we have this kind of interferences. Mm -hmm. But what is magic? What is uh, sound and beautiful? Is that this uh, this one? This beam which comes through the bottom reflected by the sun, but by the substrate. And the first one, they do interfere to give us the kiesig fringes. These are the, this is the outstanding part of it. That means that uh, the neutron wave packet goes until it reaches, it goes through all these absorbing layers, it reaches the substrate and it's uh, reflected and it comes and it interferes with this one. This interferes with this one to give us the key seat fringes. This is an outstanding uh, behavior of the neutron. So, Kola, you have another question? Or not? Yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to find out about like the, um, the, reflect, the reflective index. Um, so, <laughs> Because from basic physics again, um, it, it, what I know yes. is that the ref refractive index is is proportional to the speed of light over the the velocity of I think it's the velocity of the beam, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, you are right. That's exactly what we said here. To define the refractive index, we have to come to the Helmholtz equation type where k area is the medium dependent wave vector divided by the wave vector in a, in a vacuum. This is exactly what we did, what we said. So this divided by the wave vector in vacuum gives us the refractive index, you are right. And these are related to the velocity in the medium and the velocity in, a, uh, in vacuum. You are right. And this is the refractive index. Oh, so velocity. Thank you. Okay. You are right. Absolutely. This okay. is the beauty of the, how can I say, the approximation made by Fermi oh. to explain okay. the total reflection. There is okay. really, honestly speaking, uh, uh, yet uh, uh, these, uh, the, there are not much uh, neutron reactors, uh, research reactors, but with the ESS, there is. Uh, plethora of uh, very beautiful fundamental as well as uh, 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 technological interest uh, experiments. So, um, Coyote, you, can you speak? You, can you ask your question yourself? So, there is a question by Coyote Dada here. I will read it. Uh, hello, thanks for the lecture. Please, I would like to know if you use neutron sources to actively study mammalian cells. Oh, I am not in the field, but certainly, yes, I do. I do remember there are, yes, yes, absolutely. There right. are, there are, in effect, uh, one of the booming, uh, the boom of uh, neutron scattering uh, uh, in the 70s, uh, which has pushed the, a number of countries to invest in, uh, 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 in uh, neutron research reactor, it was biology. Uh, remember, uh, neutrons are very, very sensitive. I, I think I should uh, show this one. Uh, neutrons are, see here, for example, the coherent scattering length is the, uh, is negative for hydrogen. And because the, uh, the any biological matter is hydrogen rich and carbon rich. And therefore, biological materials and polymers are rich in hydrogen and therefore deterioration, deuterium has a positive coherent scattering length and while hydrogen is a negative. And it happened that uh, Isotopical uh, uh, marking is extremely important in uh, biology. Therefore, yes, yes, it was used extensively in biology. And uh, 
one of the most used techniques uh, in uh, uh, in neutron scattering in a small angle neutron scattering is there where the beam time is very very rare very difficult to obtain because it's uh, it's used mainly by biologists and polymer scientists yes it is possible to study mammalian i am not in the field but it is i do now yeah uh, malik i have one question so the, yeah. the 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 wave nature of the neutron is that does it depend on the speed of the neutron do you have a threshold of a velocity where you don't see uh, um, you know, the wave property is more like a particle ah. property. Yes, correct, correct. You're right. You remember we said it's thermal encoded neutrons. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. For the moment, for the moment, the, we see them with all this optical of a wave behavior of a neutron. We saw them with cold neutrons, thermal neutrons. Because, okay. uh, what can I say, because the system that we can design and the fluxes are good enough to be seen with the uh, with these neutrons but it is possible to see them with others mm -hmm. but uh, the flux is not high and the materials that uh, uh, can be engineered accordingly are not adequate yeah, we don't we don't okay. have it all right um anybody else has uh questions or comments i i told you uh i told everybody on the email that uh Professor Maza is uh, an extremely good speaker, and you can see it. It's a very clear presentation. Thank you. It's very, very nice. Uh, he has two more presentations uh, coming next week and the week after. And uh, I hope that uh, it will be also enriching as, uh, as, as this one has been. So Malik, uh, thank you again for being available to talk to us. Uh, you, were, you were going to come to Morocco, but uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it has to be postponed for all of yes. us. So we hope that next year we'll be able to do it and we'll have you in person doing this. Thank experience. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I would really ex express my gratitude for taking all of your time to come and hear my talk. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Malik. Okay. So on that note, we'll you. stop. Shukran, Malik. Malik. Shukran, shukran, Jazil. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Merci. A bientôt. So, 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 just five seconds, so Marit, if you don't mind, because we see that there is a message from uh, Mohamed who would like to ask you another question, if you don't mind. Please. So we, we use this. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if you want to, so Mohamed, you want to speak only to, to Professor Malik? There is, a, there, there is no question here. Just say thank you. We don't see any question here. I have a question for you after the lecture is Okay, on. he can contact him uh, yeah. directly. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. So you have his email address. Everybody has his email address. You can contact him uh, uh, just like it's possible to reach out to all of our lecturers. Very good. And then we, we are looking forward for next week's presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mohamed, you can also contact me if you have a question for, him, for me. You have my, my uh, email address. Okay. So um, yeah, I would like to uh, then uh, thank everybody who is connected. And uh, uh, at this point, we will stop here. And Thank we'll you, have, uh, Professor Malik, again next week. Thanks Thank you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.